No, no key, no takeaways from this morning. I think one was just always follow the trail. You know, start at the top and work way back as far as you can. Verify everything. Everything is that's possible to, to verify. Yeah, for sure. Yes, uh, yes. So use peer, peer reviewed sources that are non-biased, hopefully if you can find those. And then um, feel like having to do research papers for other classes made it feel like a review a bit, yes. So some of you may have had to do research papers, some of you may not have. What we wanna do now is take it in terms of nursing and how do you how do you change or how do you make patient care better based on evidence based practice um, I think is one is one of the keys for that. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, what do you see on your screen now. Week five lab. Thank you. Okay, so it's, I just want to do lab real quick because so we all know where we stand. Um, if it weren't the pandemic, you would have hopefully have made some appointments with either somebody from Clinica de Salud or from the hospital to come and do a home visit with them. And in doing that, you would be um, doing um, you know, family assessment, your cultural diversity, um, or you could also set up a telehealth visit um, but I feel like it's been, um, number one, going to somebody's home, probably not going to happen. A telehealth visit, I think is a good possibility, a good probability, but I feel like with only one day in clinical, you really haven't gotten your feet under you yet, or like to be comfortable to be able to maybe even try to ask somebody if you could do a telehealth follow-up visit with them or something, or, or you may not even know um, if you haven't even had a discharged patient yet, you know, a patient who was going to be discharged. So our hope is that you get to do that at some point during the semester. So the credit for lab for um, week five and six actually is that home visit, um, whether it's telehealth or whatever. So whenever you get to that point, that's, that's where the hours go. Um, and so what my thought was is I'm going to post um, a reflection activity or some self-reflection that has to do with oh yeah how to prepare for the um home visit um the family dynamics the cultural assessment like kind of pull it all together for you that so at such point in time as you're ready to make an appointment that that you feel comfortable and confident uh doing that and it won't be a big huge thing because you guys have the test on monday and it wouldn't be due till friday anyway but just to kind of put things in perspective and, and get you ready to, to make an appointment for a telehealth visit. Um, and I'm gonna post that later this afternoon because nobody's gonna look at it anyway till after Monday. So I wasn't really worried <laughs> about that. Um, but we need to account for a little bit of um, you know lab time. So I'm figuring it shouldn't take you more than um, a half hour if that to, to answer the, to, to do the self-reflection questions. Does that make sense? We good with that? Okay. And then, alrighty. Oops. And then if we go to lecture. Do, do, do. So we're talking about again health promotion. We're looking at client education. So how how do you educate your how do you educate your client? How do you know what to tell them? How do you know what they know, what they don't know, what they need to know? What has their family told them? What do they think culturally, right? There's all these things that, that play into um, edu education. And so we'll hopefully be able to describe patient education. Um, we'll just review real quick Maslow um, and also um, Knowles' theory of adult learning. 
uh, and there's pages for you to go to to look at that. Um, you know, doing education in terms of nursing and healthcare, assessing their ability to learn, um, looking at barriers, and then we're specifically at two little PowerPoints on adherence, which is uh, chapter six and seven, which is self-management um, in Giddens. So we can look at those, look at the similarities and differences. And then there's also one of the readings that you have to, had to do or have to do or will do at some point after Monday um, is the uh, imp uh, interviewing, how to, how to do motivational um, interviewing. So hopefully this should take you Make sure my link works. There it goes. We're supposed, there's the picture, right? So this just talks about like, how do, you, how do you interview somebody and get them to do what you want them to do, right? We're gonna spend all this time teaching them and we, we want them to um, adhere to what we want them to do. We want them to be able to um, manage their own, their own health to, to make sure that they're healthy and to cut costs, you know, healthcare costs as well. Um, so you have that uh, article there um right so the reading would be six seven and 41 which i'm going to do your the powerpoints for and then um and then that article um and then if we have time to do breakout rooms uh and what um what you have um access to is this page which is maslow's hierarchy of needs which i think you've already seen um but it talks about Maslow. There's a couple, um, you know, how you have to go through the stages, and then there's those couple videos that you can that you can watch. Um, I think we did that 110. Is that where we did that? I think so. Maslow keeps coming up a lot. And then there's also two articles here on um, Malcolm Knowles' adult learning theory, and also talking about um, andragogy, um, kind of versus pedagogy, um, looking at the principles. Do you know the difference between pedagogy, pedagogy and andragogy? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Anybody? I think um, andragogy have to do more with adult learning. Right, so yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, so adult, so pedagogy is more of, um, I have a slide on it, but on this presentation, pedagogy is more of like when you're in grade school and high school and we just, instructors, faculty, we just throw information at you, right? You want the PowerPoint, you want, um, you want to be told this is what you need to do. You're just sort of sucking the information up, but you're not really putting in context because in the earlier years, you don't have a whole lot of context in which to put it, right? But as an adult learner, adult learners tend to, um, let me look at this one. adult learners tend to put things in context with what they know, right? So they do, um, you're, at a, you're more mature, so here's their self-concept, right? And you want to direct your own learning. You don't necessarily, well, I'm hoping that this is <laughs> what you want to do. I don't always feel like it. That. this is hopefully where you are right you want to take part in directing your own learning however you learn best that's how you're going to learn you bring in your past experiences um, and a lot of times like for you guys you guys are ready to learn or you wouldn't be here right if you're in high school or grade school right you have to be there you have to go to school right but you don't have to necessarily go to college you for sure don't have to go to nursing school right so there's a reason that you're here so you're ready to learn um, and then you want, um, you know, you're entering a new field, uh, practical reasons to learn. And then there's some kind of internal motivation, right? So for kids, it's more of like, you know, if I get bad grades or maybe I'll get a reward if I get good grades, but intrinsically you are, um, uh, you're motivated to learn, to, to become a nurse, for example. Um, and so that's, that's more the difference between andragogy and, and pedagogy. And so the way we teach, we teach as if you are adult learners. So that's why a lot of times when, when we hear, oh, well, we want more PowerPoints or, you know, just tell us what to do, that's not really, that's more pedagogy than andragogy. And we're trying to, we're trying to, um, to reach you through, through the adult learning theory if that makes sense. And then you also have, there's, I'm um, talking about discharge planning here. 
Um, there's this whole um, ideal way uh, to do discharges. And then this is a little video on um, how to do a teach back. Right, do you know what I mean when I say do a teach back? Right, you taught somebody something and you're gonna have them teach it back to you so that you know that they know. Cause that's one of the best ways to learn by the way is to teach it. And so um, when you are doing your peer reviews, I think it's great because you get to, you know, for your, your skills uh, and interventions, right? Be the patient, right? Watch them, um, you know, see what the other person is doing and give feedback. Um, I think that's a, that's a great way, right? Don't just like be in a little bubble, like learn. Um, okay, so, and then the, I think I put it on here. Oh no, I didn't put it on here. And so this is where you need to do the, um, the teaching video on some topic uh, that you can choose. And I'll review that when we get to the, the end. I need to put a rubric up. I forgot to put the rubric up. Um, disinfect your stethoscope for sure. All right, let's go to, I have it here real quick. So what is, what's adherence? When somebody says I'm adhering to this principle or I'm adhering to um, this particular uh, medication regimen that the doctor or nurse uh, has for me. Nobody. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we can do some, we can do some breakout rooms. Um, yeah, we can do that. Let me just get through this kind of quickly and then yes, you can do that. Um, so you're going to look at how to apply client education. You're going to assess their ability, explore barriers, right? And then discuss adherence. That's where we are right now in this particular one. What is the concept of adherence? So, what, what does it mean when I say adherence? So I'll just keep going, right? So self-initiation, right? Adhering to, uh, to, to whatever it is that you've been told to do, right? You follow instructions. Um, is it easy to adhere to certain things? No, no, not always. Right. And if you're compliant, that's um, your, your compliant behavior your, is because you're doing what they told you to do. Right. And so you're adhering to it. Somebody told you to do it. Um, and so if it's a treatment or medication regimen, that's, that's what you're doing. But you can, you can adhere. I just thought this was kind of interesting. It could be adherent, like I'm totally doing what the doctor told me or I'm doing part of what the doctor told me, but it's not intentional. I'm not doing it on purpose. Like I'm missing a piece of information or a step. Um, or it is partial ad adherence because it is intentional. I know I'm supposed to do it, I'm just not doing it. Um, and then there's like total non-adherence to everything. So there's sort of this continuum. I think we see a lot of this at Clinica de Salud. You may see it also in the hospital, but um, I think in speaking with the students that I had the last two weeks at Clinica, this, this becomes a question, you know, why are they or are they not adhering to what the physician or the provider has told them um, to do? And so if you don't adhere, there's problems that you can have. The health profession, um, you know, you get into this relationship of why didn't you do what I told you? I told you to do this. Now look, you have higher blood pressure and we have to do this and, but I have empathy, but I don't have empathy. And then as related to the healthcare system, then there's increased cost because people aren't, um, they're using more healthcare services and it costs, it costs more money. Um, so I, I don't necessarily care about the attributes and criteria for adherence. Um, so this is, um, we can do this one. This is I think pair share um, is, well, that applies to the attributes. I don't wanna talk about the attributes. We'll keep doing another one because there's no, no test question on that. Um, so planned behavior, right? Integrates vari variable, like your attitude is the, what's the norm. Um, so you have attitudes, what you think about something, the norms of what like 
normal people do like what the normal expectation is and then there's like this perceived behavioral control like somebody's controlling me and so then i decide okay what do i intend to do and am i actually going to do the behavior um and so there's a, if the health belief model says that if you figure if you feel like you're um like it's going to make you like you're going to not get sick then you're, you're going to do it. So if I, if I could be sick, if I don't do it, I'm gonna do it. Um, if it's gonna really disrupt my daily life, the severity of this illness, then I'm gonna take my medication. Um, if I feel better, like I don't get winded going up a flight of stairs, then I'm, I'm gonna do it. Um, and it's easy for me to do, right? That would be the health belief model. Um, and I think this is what's really important is figuring out factors that affect adherence. Um, so are you adhering to the medication, the, um, the management of it, and then, um, which is why the self-management component comes in, and then there's science behind it. So is that another reason why we're ad adhering to it? So there's a difference between compliance, which we kind of talked about already, right? Compliance is obedience. The doctor told me to do it. I'm going to do it. That's just the, that's just the way it is. Or disobedience, which would be the doctor said to do it and I'm not going to do it. Persistence would be in regards to chronic disease management. It's, it's one thing to have an infection. We had this in Clinica this week. We had a, a patient with a UTI and the, and the provider had prescribed, and Vanessa, correct me if I'm wrong, um, had prescribed, I believe, a seven day course of antibiotics. Well, the patient came back like the next, I don't know, the next couple weeks and, and had a UTI again. And she said she stopped taking it after like two or three days because three days, four days, something like that, because she felt better. So the physician actually said, well, this time I'm going to order an antibiotic that she only has to take for three days. Because I know she took it for the two or three days already. So if I order prescribe one that now is three days worth of antibiotics, I can do that. It, but when you have a chronic disease, and you have to get prescriptions every month and you have to remember when to take them and you have to remember to check your blood pressure, check your blood sugar, do all those things. It, it can get really tiring. And then a concordance is a mutual agreement between patient and provider. So I was actually listening on the radio yesterday, like, I feel like your health is between you and your provider, right? So whatever you decide, as long as it's safe and there's evidence behind it and you can adhere to it and manage it, then that should be acceptable. Um, so in nursing, we tend to look at patients as being non-compliant. Um, we try not to use that term anymore, non-compliant. I think adherence is a little bit of a better term in nursing, um, just because what non-compliance has a negative connotation to it. And there could be some really good reasons why they're not adhering to it. To, to what they're supposed to be doing. Like they didn't have transportation. They don't have any money. They had to go to work. Um, this is the only food that they can get because they're going to the food bank every week. So they don't really have a choice of what, of what food they, they can eat. Uh, and then these are the interrelated concepts. So that's where spirituality, culture come into uh, play, family dynamics, and then cognition as far as your understanding of what you're supposed to do developmental level and what you're physically capable of doing as, as far as functional ability. Can I adhere to the exercise uh, regimen that the physician provider wants me to, to do? Yeah, cost, exactly. The things cost, yeah, everything, it costs so much money, even with insurance. So with insurance, there's costs and, and with insurance and without insurance, there's costs. Or this insurance covers this, but this one doesn't. Um, and then you turn 65 and you have to have Medicare, which is different. And when the kids turn 26, they don't have yours. They have like getting my kids on Medi-Cal was like just applying for the insurance was ridiculous. Um, and so we just talked about short term, long term medication management, like the difference between that, um, the dietary modification. So what types of um, disease process or concepts would you need dietary modifications for? Diabetes. Diabetes. What else do you need dietary modifications for besides diabetes? Hypertension. Renal hypertension. Failure. Yeah, oh, renal failure. Nice. Yes, hypertension. 
and renal failure. And there's other ones, but those are some pretty big ones. You probably, lupus, yep. You've probably seen a couple, have seen a couple in the hospital. I'll, I'll, yep, low sodium foods. And then the, the, the adventure begins when you have hypertension and diabetes and you're on dialysis because then you've got to look at electrolytes, your sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, as well as, you know, look, it's, yeah, it can get very, um, very complicated. And then as far as like exercise, flu shots, sunscreen, um, I think people are doing better with smoking. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I don't see as many people around smoking. Um, but does that make sense as far as adherence? So think of it as adherence, not non-compliance, right? And that you can partially adhere or not adhere. Um, oh, that's right. They do vape now, don't they? I eh, forgot about that. Know the difference or know the definitions for compliance, persistence, and concordance. And then, um, you know, how we just kind of talked about how the concepts um, affect adherence. Um, culture can play a big part, you know, language, understanding, um, a lot of different ways. I don't know, does that help you think a little bit differently? I think sometimes we tend to judge a lot. Um, and I think it's, I think the key, as we always say, the first step is assessment, assess, ask the questions. Um, you know, why, not so many why questions, but like, why is this happening? What can we do to help? What barriers are you finding? Let's work through some of these. Let's get you some resources, as opposed to just saying, well, you need to um, decrease your sodium intake, right? Does that make, like, what, how does it feel for you if you're at the doctor's office and they say, well, you need to do this, but I can't, I don't know, right? I mean, that you don't feel so good when, the, when it comes to that type of conversation, right? So, um, Okay, now we're gonna look at self-management, which would be how you manage your, um, your own healthcare. Yeah, easy level, easy reading level for patients, for sure. So, and we're gonna look at the interrelated concepts, barriers, which are a lot of the same, and then um, the attributes um, that go along with self-management. So, it's the ability of an individual or their caregiver, right, because a lot of times it's a caregiver, to engage in the daily tasks required to maintain health and well-being or to respond to physical, physiological, behavioral, emotional sequelae, like the, the, not consequences, but the outcomes of a chronic disease based on their knowledge of the condition, consequences, and plan of care that is co-developed, right? So it's in conjunction with their healthcare team. I think that piece is missing. Do you guys feel like that sometimes, that it's, that that, that piece is missing, that it's just sort of a one-sided kind of thing? And so um, the daily tasks, taking the medication, doing the exercise, um, eating the right foods, those types of things. Um, understanding that having a chronic disease has emotion to it and physiological components and psychological components. So it's, it's a holistic kind of type, type of definition. And so again, you can have optimal, totally great self-management to like no self-management at all. Um, and it can change and obviously is influenced by a lot of different variables. So this would be the key thing to know, self-efficacy. Oh, confidence in, there's a typo, right? I, I can do this, right? How, how many times do you go in and, in and you're looking at the patient and maybe they bring a family member, but you don't feel like the patient feels confident, right? Like, cause the other person is like kind of running their life for them in, in different types of ways, right? So you have to, the patient has to have some type of confidence to know that they can do this. They can figure out how to, um, oh, that's, that's, I'm sorry, I'm reading the chat, sorry. Chronic, many people with chronic diseases have problems getting healthcare teams to actually treat them. Yep, that's true. Sometimes that would be, that is the, would be the opposite end. They have to fight for it, right? And that's where that concordance, you know, where, the, where that's the, you and your provider are supposed to be working together. Um, the patient engagement, like do they understand, are they, are they capable of actually giving themselves an insulin injection um, or taking medications? You know, what have their learning experiences been? What, what do they know about health education? Have they been educated? Does it, does it make a difference to them? 
Um, there's your patient provider partnership, right? The, the provider is supposed to be the vehicle to get them to help the patient uh, continue with their regimen. And then the disease management, um, you know, to manage chronic conditions. But I think, I think you're right, Emily. Sometimes they don't want to, or they, I don't know. I don't know if they feel like it's a lost cause or. Uh, I think a lot of times they don't believe you. Um, and this is coming from personal experience and from mm -hmm. a lot of friends. Um, and especially if you are having people not believe you or not willing to treat you um, and you're and then not willing to give you um, referrals to other people who have been known to treat people with the mm -hmm. similar types of symptoms and disease processes, it can be really hard. And then especially when you feel like you're not having somebody either treating your pain management or treating your GI issues, and then you have to end up in the ER and then the ER doctor ends up writing lies about you, like that you're seeking um, mm -hmm. pain meds. Even like I had a friend who this happened to recently, she went in because she couldn't get in to see the pain management doctor for three weeks, but literally could not move. And so had to go to the ER and even though she um, like denied certain pain meds and denied different things, the doctor basically went in and vote, wrote a bunch of inaccurate information and called her a drug seeker and said that she was lying about her conditions and a bunch of other stuff that's now on her permanent record. So when new and current doctors look at it, they're going to be less likely to believe her. Um, and so she's going to be less likely to get treatment. Mm -hmm. And then what does that do for the patient, <clears throat> excuse me, as far as their, you know, adherence and or self-management when they're not believed, right? I mean, that just, why do I want, you, at some point you get too tired to fight or potentially, right? You know, and so then, then that's just a vicious circle. That's too bad. I'm sorry for your friend. Um, so we talked a little briefly about different cognitive theories theoretical links for why people do what they do, reinforcement, um, feelings about things. Um, in nursing, for us, <clears throat> especially right now, first semester, we're talking about health, wellness, health enhancement, right? Um, Pre-disease or disease prevention. What if it's, you know, helping the patient through these things? How do you manage, um, you know, the prevention? How do you not get the disease? Or if you're pre-diabetic, and trying not to become diabetic, what education, what steps do you need to take? Or what if there's a new, <clears throat> excuse me, a new diagnosis, like helping a patient through a new diagnosis and all that um, learning and self-awareness and understanding that goes with that um, is, is, is diff can be difficult. And then, you know, managing an acute event. So if you're in the hospital, there's an acute event, um, you know, being able to manage, to manage that. Um, from the nursing perspective, knowing what to do, um, and then carrying that through with the patient. Now something happened. So, so you know, like they come in in DKA, their blood sugar is like really, really, really high. Well, how did we get there? You know, how could we prevent this? Did they have the resources? I think resources are huge. If you don't have the resources, then uh, that's not a good thing. Um, so uh, we're not going to, I want to do the, the groups in the um, patient education piece. So um, these are, again, interrelated concepts to self-management. And you can see that adherence that we already just talked about, right? That goes along with self-management both ways. It goes both directions. And then we're going to talk about patient education next. And that's when we'll talk about your uh, education video as well. And patient education you know, that's what helps the person be adherent to know what they need to do and to follow the plan of care, right? And then also patient education and self-management. So this, this is the piece, this little triangle here is the piece that we're talking about today, but also health promotion, care coordination, and or lack of, right? So just because you have these things, what if you don't have these things? What if there isn't collaboration in your healthcare team? What if nobody's coordinating the care or all the pieces can't come together to, to do it correctly? Um, and then health disparities, right? That was, what was that week? Well, we did that in 110 as well, right? But that was like week, week two, week three. How does that play into uh, being able to self-manage your health? Um, excuse me, uh, box 7.1. These are just the featured example, exam, exemplars, sorry. Pediatric asthma. So when you think in terms of like adults, you're thinking of type two diabetes, hypertension, maybe depression. Um, on the flip side in the childbearing, child rearing family, prenatal care, 
and pediatric asthma, like being able to manage your own condition, the pediatric asthma, especially knowing which inhaler to use, when to use it, what it's for, having your asthma action plan posted on the refrigerator, um, knowing when to call the doctor, um, remembering to take your medication, those types of things all play into self-management. Um, so be able to describe self-management, the interrelated concepts that we just talked about. Um, and I think we pretty much compared and contrasted self-management and adherence. Yes? Can I get a thumbs up from somebody? Okay. So now we'll move to the um, patient education. I'm assuming everybody's doing okay? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> I appreciate it. And I have some practice questions in this one, I believe as well. So patient education, have you had opportunities to do any patient education in your, in your clinical so far? What opportunities have you had? <laughs> there we go. Yeah, nutrition. Mm -hmm. What did John? What did you teach? What did you do teaching for? Um, me and Claudia talked about um, blood thinners and AFib. Mm. Oh, okay. Nice options of care. That's kind of a tough decision, a tough conversation. Potentially. Safety. Mm -hmm. So see, you're already starting to do that, right? I mean, and that's, that's what nurses do. We educate. Um, and we're going to focus on the uh, patient education piece of it. So what is patient education? I already showed you where those pages, those links are to Maslow and Knowles. So that's where you're going to get that information for the second objective. Um, and then we're going to demonstrate, you know, when and how to apply education. We're going to talk about assessing their ability to learn. Um, oh, I forgot the end parentheses on that one. Um, and look at barriers to teaching and learning in healthcare and how to overcome them. I think we can all think of some <laughs> barriers. Uh, so patient education. Anything that provides patients and families, caregivers, right, all those, anybody in that environment with information that enables them to make informed choices, right? That's what we talk about, informed consent, informed choices, right? Knowing um, who was it? Francisco said as far as options of care, right? So informed about options they have available to them so that they can make choices about their care, health, and well-being. And it also helps them gain knowledge and skills to participate to adhere to and to self-manage, if you will, their health and their living processes. Does that make sense? That's why we did adherence and self-management moving into patient education. And oftentimes we'll use patient teaching, patient education as interchangeable um, terms. So when you look at the scope, um, patient education is here and there um, can be self-directed learning. So we just talked about the patient is consumer, right? And they're going online and looking things up and generally they're going to Google and Dr. Oz and different people. And so we have to look at the reliability, validity of that information. There's also formal classes, right? You can sign up to take formal uh, hypertension, you know, classes for diabetes, nutrition. And then there's also patient nurse um, learning encounters where, where we are talking with our, our patients. Um, it can be um, you know, you can, you can do it online, you can do it face to face, you can do it on the phone. Um, it can be formal, informal, um, hopefully it is individualized, but it can be in a group format as well. So I'm going to put you in your learning groups to talk about, um, this will be a think pair share. So it's be like two or three of you in a group, um, and discuss different examples or spe sorry, specific examples of patient education approaches. So what we just said, the self-directed formal patient nurse encounters, think of um, 
I want you to think of specific examples of when you might use each one of those like is there a specific type of edu like nutrition if you're going to teach something on nutrition if it's hypertension or if it's diabetes which is there is one of those three more more effective or would help more with self management or um, or adherence let me put you in your breakout rooms right got it like five minutes of talking about those different types of approaches to learning and how you decide what the best approach is. Thank you, Alex. I know somebody's out there listening. There we go. All right. You ready? There you go. And I'll try and jump in on a couple.
We'll bring people back. Hello, Miss Amanda. Hello. I actually, oops, I actually lost connection there. That's okay. I'm bringing everybody back anyway. Okay, perfect. Thank you. How was you? How what? How was it? So I missed out on a part of it there. I'm kind of coming in and out today. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. I'm just sorry. I can't give you my full attention right now. No, that's all right. Hopefully you're learning something. That's Definitely. Absolutely. Okay, okay good. <laughs> that was the right answer. <laughs> Yay. Um. So can this should you should be able to see the entire all the slides. That's what I have right now. That's my brain. I just left you in your groups, guys. I figured that was more beneficial. I kept feeding you questions because they all kind of rolled off of each other. So um, I have two minutes left. So obviously, if you need to leave, that's fine. Um, it's being recorded. Um, what? Um, Oh, I wanted to ask you. So for the teaching video, would you be more comfortable if you also had an option of doing um, not a teaching plan, but like a poster or a handout or some other way of doing the teaching besides a video? Because I can add that as an option for those of you that, um, uh, uh, what do I want to say, that, that, you know, are uncomfortable maybe doing a video, although we're doing videos all the time now. But at least it would give you, um, yes, please. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would like that option. Okay, I'll write it up some way yeah. that you can do either either one, um, and then it will be um, it can be any age group. So I'll give you you know like teenagers, children, adults, elderly. We'll have that that scope as well, and then you can choose um, either a concept or a disease process. Like we can do nutrition perfusion, um, but if there's another one that you want to want to talk about that's fine um if it's a handout then there's not really a time frame i would say for for the patient teaching if you were going to do a video choose one thing and then maybe five minutes or you know no more than five minutes on that for the video um but i figure and again it's not going to be due i know nobody's going to do it till after monday that's why i'm offering options to hopefully take some of the stress off of oh my gosh i have to do another video um because not everybody likes to do videos so if that that works for people then i'm good with that i want to help with your learning right it's not about me well sometimes it is but it's about it's about you right we're just talking now about assessing the learner right and i i get the feeling not everybody probably wants to do a video so um so what did you what did you learn from your breakout groups? What, okay, let me ask this one. What barriers do nurses have when it comes to teaching? Language. Language. Language, nice. Communication, language, education level, cultural. Potentially some biases, sure. You have a family. The patient's family. Ooh, I like that. In what way? Um, if they're at odds with the patient or they just don't want to hear what you're trying to say and they kind of play the middleman <laughs> and they, they kind of block you from the patient, you know, you kind of have to sometimes separate the patient from the family so you actually get the information across that you're trying to explain. Mm -hmm. Um, the patient's willingness to learn or change their habits, right? You come in, that's part of the assessment piece. Um, if when you guys look on at the PowerPoint on your on your own, um, that's part of the assessment piece. Are they willing to learn? Do they even want to learn? Does it matter <clears throat> if you're discharging the patient? Does it matter if they want to learn or not? I mean, I'm just asking. Yes. It does. But if they don't want to learn, are we still going to do the discharge teaching? Yes. I would say yes. 
we're, we're, that's our duty. That's our obligation to provide them with the information to be able to make an informed decision or to, or to adhere to or to self-manage their health care plan, their health care regimen. So yes, we have to take some of those things into account, but we also have a specific duty to, um, yeah, AMA is a whole nother ball game, John. Um, yeah, you can't really, uh, you, it, yeah, if they're AMA, AMA, there's like a form and then they're gone. You just document that what you did or weren't able to do. Um, and yes, kids, parents of children, parents of children, <laughs> parents, <laughs> right? Uh, same thing with the family. Right, you know, because the, the the parents may not want to do something. If it's a teenager, do you talk to the teenager? Do you talk to the parent? Like, do you talk to both of them? How do you do that? I still haven't heard or seen, I might have missed it in the chat, a barrier that a nurse has to providing education to their patient. Yeah, I would say, uh, I don't know if it's really a barrier, but what I noticed last time is my patient was in, she's having a lot of pain. So, that was hard to make her really like into you know what what was the expectation yes. so for me i feel like it's kind of barrier mm -hmm. policy lack of resources yep still not hitting the one i'm thinking of how about if i say discharge teaching yes yes medic cruz um i'm thinking time Right, because when do you start discharge planning? When they get there. When they get there, there should be a collective on admission. You say, <laughs> when do you start just at admission? There you go, David, David S. <laughs> right, and so hopefully as a team, we've all done our part and been teaching as we go, but now I've got three, four, five patients. I've got an admission coming, somebody's coming back from surgery, and I've got to discharge you so I have a free bed because we need, we're short on beds. How much time do I have? And I see this in OB a lot. They're all packing up, right? It's time to go. I get to go home. I'm packing up the baby stuff. I'm packing up my stuff. I don't have time, <laughs> right? They don't want to hear it, which is why it should be done, um, excuse me, all along. So that's good. Um, so I will put up admission, yeah, time and, oh yeah, they, uh, what is it? Reading level of like seventh or eighth grade level and in one of the groups I was in, because I think we forget it, literacy, right? They may look like they can read or they can talk, I don't want to say talk a good talk, that's not the way I mean it, but right, that you would never know they've compensated for so long for not being able to read um, that you kind of need to double check or watch the nonverbals, right? And it has to be a language they can understand. So if it's, if they're mis, is it Misteco, 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 then it needs to be in that dialect, right? It can't be, it can't just be Spanish, right? You have to try and get the close, as close as you can to their, the language that they understand, um, which is why you have the, um, the translators available, hopefully, or the language line or those types of things that are specific to that patient. Um, okay, so hopefully that was helpful. I will post the little self-reflection for the lab. I will put up the assignment for the video, non-video. Um, yes, it has to be a certified translator. That is correct. Um, but I'll put up that information. Don't worry about it till after Monday. I know that, you know that. Um, I'm available over the weekend. I might do a pop-up if people feel like you need it. I might do a pop-up on Saturday for office hours. Um, anything else you need from me? Besides, you know, A's on everything. But that's not me, that's you. I what would you say is the best way to study for the exam? Um, so I would say, um, you're, so look at the question distribution, which is in under the syllabus tab, because that will tell you approximately how many, I mean, that's supposed to be how many questions that for each category, each concept that we talk about and then go to the um, weekly outcomes, weekly learning outcomes and objectives for each day, you know, in the week. And then for me specifically, if you're looking at the PowerPoints, go to the that's a wrap slide, cause that kind of um, uh, wrap up slides, look at that. Um, cause that sort of gives you the key things that I'm looking for and that I will probably ask questions about. Okay. 
I don't know if that helps, but like if you go through, if you go through each outcome, right, and like write some information about everything, then then that will help you. What else? Thumbs up from Aaron. Thank you. Thumbs up from Whitney. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry to keep, I'm so long winded. That's the when the explore comes out. Um, Cause I'm kind of a square with my, with my, uh, you know, with my, my excites a little bit, but everything else is like within a degree of each other. So that's why I spin a lot. <laughs> Cause I'm constantly going from one to the other. Alrighty. So take care, have fun, have fun, have fun studying. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, you know what I mean? Get a little rest and relaxation and study too. Um, I will we'll post an announcement. It will be um, synchronous, synchronous at 11, let's see, Monday, 11 o'clock. Um, so it'd be, and it should be about 75 minutes worth that you'll have available to you for the test. Um, but it would be at 11 o'clock. It'll be on Proctorio. Um, we'll put up a link. We'll probably, no, 47 assignments aren't do today there what assignment is there for 47 that's due there's one called the week four case study with the juan family oh no was that week four or week five it says group activity week four which is due tonight at 12 p.m oh don't worry about that i'll take it off okay thank I'm you so sorry. much i don't even know yeah you're good <laughs> but we don't have to do it no or can, can we work on it if we choose to you can sure because okay. anything anything more that you do is going to help you understand the concepts and be able to answer the questions i just don't want to put extra pressure on you i would rather you look at the health promotion think about like the patient education like look at this powerpoint and think about the breakout group conversations you had you're mm -hmm. not getting tested on this anyway right there is no exam mm -hmm. in this course right it's the community project pretty much but understanding some of this was, um, was um, you know, will help you with the other things that you're learning about. Yeah. Okay. Understood. All right, if, if people have submitted, then I'll take a look and I'll figure something out. All right, I don't wanna ding people that already put the work in. So we'll, we'll figure something out. I wanna be equitable. Okay, okay, okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Do you know if there's 225 today? I don't know. I actually talked to Mr. Beamer on my way to Starbucks this morning um, on a different matter. And uh, I don't know. No, no, no lab hours for today because you're going to, when I put up the reflection, that's going to be the lab hours. Um, Hugo, stop it. Stop, Hugo. Hugo. <laughs> take that down. Let's what? See. What's he doing? I don't want to know. Put a picture of. Oh, <laughs> got it. Well, then you go answer the question. Oh, you're gonna be. I see. It's B. Mr. Beamer. I got. I see it now. I see it now. Um. Oh man, I I got Clark on that one really good. Yes.